National Back to Church Sunday. Hope you've been working on some folks and praying for some folks and inviting people and encouraging them to come be a part of our, our service. It's going to be a great service. We're going to fill this house up next Sunday. Amen. It's going to be a great day in the Lord. You just don't want to miss it. So be sure, don't come by yourself. Amen. Bring somebody with you or meet somebody here at least. Uh, if you have to bribe them, tell them you'll buy them lunch, whatever. Amen. But uh, it'll be worth your time. It'll be worth their time. It'll be worth the investment as well in their time. God's up to some great things in people's lives. So we just give him the opportunity to do so. Amen. Amen. So we get into our message today. It's not a normal kind of sermon that I would normally preach, but there's some things I think will be helpful to you. The first thing I want to tell you is that if you're a part of our journey class today, that has been postponed. We have several people who just couldn't make it. So we're just going to move it a few weeks. We'll be in touch with you. We've got your number and stuff. So uh, our journey class will take place uh, in just a few weeks. We'll call you and set that date. But our National Back to Church Sunday is that Sunday when we reach out and seek to invite as many people as we can. And uh, I want to talk to you this morning about two things. One, why we come to church, and, and two is why do we invite people to church? And those are important things because a lot of people don't get it. I mean, they don't, they don't understand the concept of church. We're living in a generation in the world today that doesn't really uh, relate to church. They don't, they don't go to church. And in fact, there's just a lot of people who used to go to church that don't go to church anymore. So I want to talk about some of those things this morning. I don't know if our PowerPoint will work or not, we'll, but we're going to start, and you can kind of catch up with me as we do when it finishes crashing. We put a new computer in a few weeks ago, and it doesn't like the software for some reason, or doesn't like me. I haven't figured out which it is. Some of y'all heard the story about the guy who, uh, you know, is a Wife's trying to get him out of bed and make him go to church, and he didn't want to get out of bed and go to church. And, you know, she says, you get out of bed, we're going to go to church. He says, why on earth would you want to stay home? The man said, I got two reasons. One, I don't like those people. And second, they don't like me, so I'm not going. He said, well, I'm going to give you two reasons why you ought to go. First, you're, you're a grown adult, and number two, you're the pastor. So... <laughs> Well, I want to tell you, I definitely wanted to come to church today. I love church. I love being with you. I love worshiping God. I love the music. I love the people. I love the fellowship. I love being at Believer's Fellowship. These are some of the finest people in the world. Amen? Uh, I told our leadership group the, uh, the other night, I said, you know, heaven's going to be fun being there for a long time with you guys. So praise the Lord. I'm not wishing that anybody uh, go ahead of me. Just wait till I get there. We'll all go together. Amen? Hopefully in the rapture. But next Sunday is the National Back to Church Sunday, and I do really want you to, to focus in on today. And let me just tell you some reasons why I come to church. In fact, I'm going to give you ten, so you better write fast because we're going to hit them fast. And really, about four of them are just kind of fringe benefits. The other reasons are pretty much obvious reasons why we ought to be a, a, incited and, and want to go to church. And then I'm going to give you, after that, about five reasons why we should invite people to come to church and the kind of people we should be inviting. The first is this, reason to come to church. One is because I really do love God. I'm a child of God. I was born of God. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, God's done a work in your life. His Holy Spirit is in you. And if you love the Lord, then you, you have this new con concept and understanding that the Bible teaches that you're the bride of Christ. You belong to Jesus. And the bride of Christ in the New Testament is called the church. Uh, what marks a, a genuine, deep relationship about a bride and a groom is love. And we should love the Lord. In fact, that's the first commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all the heart. Amen. All your mind, your soul, your body, and your strength. And Jesus makes it clear throughout the New Testament that when we come to him, we become these new people. We're, we're a new kind of people. And he has made us part of his body. He's made us part of his bride. I'm a part of the body of Christ. I'm part of the bride of Christ. The Bible tells us Jesus died for his bride. So since I love him, and he has such a high priority in the scripture about it, then it certainly, if I am a child of God, it ought to be a high priority with me. It's the first John 4 says, by this, the love of God was manifested where? In us, that God sent his only son, begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He's redeemed us. He's saved us. He's forgiven us. God sent his son because he loved us. The Bible says not because we love God first. He loved us first. Now out of my relationship with him, love pours forth, and I want to be where he is and where he's moving. And God has obviously, if you believe the Bible, set the church aside to be his bride in the way in which he works, not only in the world, but really the Bible talks about, read the book of Colossians, in the whole universe displaying us as his bride to the, whole, to the whole world. Number two, why do I come to church? I really do not only love God, I love God's family. 
I love God's people. If you go through 1 John, there's that verse again, but the last of it, we put one more verse at the end where it talks about he died, the, pro the propitiation for our sins. The last part of that says, Beloved, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. So there it is. If I love Christians, I want to be around Christians. If I love believers, I want to fellowship with believers. That's why we call it Believer's Fellowship, by the way, amen? That we can be where God wants us to be. I love God, God loves me, and if I love God and God loves me, he said, well, the obvious byproduct of that relationship will be I'll have a love for other Christians. In fact, church, you know, is where we gather first, uh, where we fulfill what the Bible, what I call in the Bible, the one another's of God's word. Like found in Galatians 6.10, it says, you know, uh, let us do good to all people, especially to those of the household of God or the family of believers. That's just one of almost 40 verses in the New Testament where it says one another. Serve one another, edify one another, encourage one another, meet with one another, uh, take communion together. All these passages in Scripture that talk about one another, one another, one another. And do you realize that if you're really going to take notice of those commands and it's going to have to be around someone besides yourself, that you can't do that at home? You know, you can't do that by yourself? And all these other scriptures that talk about, you know, the Lord talks about, about, about uh, taking communion together, receiving the teaching together, worshiping the Lord together. Uh, another verse I'll show you in just a moment talks about, let us don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I, I once had a lady come to me, and she was uh, looking for reasons not to come to church. And she said, well, just where in the Bible does it says we need to be active in church? So I ran her about three pages of scriptures out. You know, to me, they're just obvious. But I guess if you're looking for a way out instead of a way in, it's easy to kind of overlook the stuff that says what you don't really want to hear. So, but if we love God and then we, 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 we love his people, then we'll want to be together and we'll want to fellowship together. The third reason, I want to express my love that I have for God and he has for me by doing what he says. First John says, listen, by this we know, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. As I said, those close to 40 one another, there's about 30 of those one another verses in the New Testament where it talks about relationship to other people in the, in, the, in the body of Christ. There's about 30 of those you can't do. You can't keep them unless you're part of a, of a fellowship, unless you're part of a church, and you're interacting in that church. They, they're just impossible to do unless you're, you're active within a body of believers somehow, somewhere, in some way. But if I love God, hey, hey, I know that we love the children of God. When we love God, we observe, we observe His commandments. I come to church because this is God's will for my life. This is God's plan for the universe. It's God's church whereby he disciples us. It's God's church which means he gives us so many places to, to, to be what he's called us to be. Hebrews 10 is that verse I mentioned a while ago. In Hebrews 10, it says, I hit a button by accident. Would you advance one page for me, please, sir? In Hebrews 10, 25, there's too many buttons on this new switcher. I'm just now getting used to it. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, the day approaching is obviously the day when the Lord returns. He says, the closer we get to that day, then the more we need to be together, and the more we need to encourage each other, and the more we need to fellowship together as we see that day approaching. Pretty simple what the Lord is saying here. I want to express my love to God by be, being obedient to His Word. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, it's every man has received the gift. What gift? It's the way the, way the, word, the, the, the Holy Spirit works in our life. We've all been given spiritual gifts. We should minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What's he telling us? He's saying, if you're a Christian, God has given you a spiritual gift, but he hasn't given it for you. He's given it for the body. Now, you receive the benefits of having that spiritual gift, but you're just getting one of all the spiritual gifts. We need each other, just as if I'm going to stand straight up, it helps to have all ten toes working. You take one toe out of the equation, and it becomes difficult to walk. It becomes difficult to move. Have you ever sprained your ankle? It's not the whole leg. It's just your ankle. It's just a very small part of your whole body. But it's an important part. But every part of the body is important. Every one of you are important. Every one of you are going to grow. It's important to relate to the rest of the body of Christ. And the best way I can do that is, I, hey, I want to experience God's love, and I want to express my love to God by just being obedient to the things He's given us in Scripture. But I also want to have meaningful maturity and growing in my own life. And coming to the, 
to church weekly, exposing myself to the Word of God, having ears to hear, hearing truth, hearing teaching, hearing preaching, being with God's people, certainly prompts me to want to go deeper with God and further with God and mature with God. As I did share this Friday night at our leadership banquet, the fact that to be a part of Believer's Fellowship usually signifies something very important other than just, yes, I love the Lord, but it signifies, hey, I want to be in a church where the, pr where the truth is preached. And I want to be in the church that challenges me to go deeper with God, that, 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 that moves me to the place where I can, be, I can have a more meaningful expression of my walk and my love and my faith with God. It's because here is where we preach the Word of God. And it's the Word of God that transforms and changes people's lives. It feeds, it gives light, it gives light, it gives instruction. But it's not just the Word in itself that we get at church. It's the, it's the fellowship of the saints coming together where we practice those one another's of edification, of encouragement, of even reproof at some times. I want to be around people who sharpen me. You know, there's that old saying, you lie down with dogs, you're going to get up with fleas. All right, so I don't want to lie down with dogs and I don't want to get up with fleas. I want to be with the people of God and I want to be around people who will strengthen my walk with God, encourage me in my walk with God. And Proverbs says, or Ecclesiastes says, as iron sharpens iron, so does a man's friends sharpen his countenance. Now, what does that mean? It means that your friends make an impact in your life. In the spiritual realm, we impact. We sharpen each other. We help each other. We make a difference. And by the way, when iron sharpens iron, there's usually some sparks that fly. Sometimes in the house of God, you may have a conflict. You may get mad at somebody in church. God forbid. Does that happen? Yes. But it, ultimately, as children of God, we know we are learning how to go deeper and how to grow up and how to be mature. So we learn how to re reconcile those relationships. And even out of a negative, conflicting situation, we can get deeper and we can go farther and we can aspire to be better what, than, than where, where God found us. We can go and mature and become more like Jesus Christ. That is something you're not going to get in the world. You're not going to get it, you know, on Sunday mornings. I see uh, when I'm going out to early in the mornings in the campus, the other campus, especially at this time of year, there's going to be thousands of people on motorcycles. They take that little 249 out to Tomball, and they take it up to Magnolia. They take those back roads. You know, and there's just hundreds of motorcyclists going out, there, and they're all getting together having their little church thing, you know, in their mind. It's a fellowship. It's identification. All right? And then, then, then some mornings I get up and, then, and there's all the bicyclists. They got the cute little helmets on with a little rear view mirror attached, you know, and little spandex pants. <laughs> Going down the street, doing their little thing, you know, and, and they're just, they're just it's usually five, six, maybe ten. They've got the little fellowship going. Now, some of them are going to be out at the golf course in their little fellowship. They're in their little carts riding around hitting a little white ball, you know, down the field. Now, all the, listen, what you're going to get at church with the people of God is so much better, so much more meaningful, makes a greater difference in your life than you're going to get down at the golf course or the beach or the bar or anywhere else in fellowship. Because we are the people of God, and when two or more are gathered in my name, I am there, he said, to be in their midst. You ain't going to get that just a bunch of motorcycles on Sunday morning. Our bicyclist, well, we're a Christian group. Well, get in church, then go. Can I get an amen on it? <laughs> First Peter 4.10, I shared this scripture just a while ago. We've been given a gift. And if we've been given a gift, God's called us to minister to that gift. Why? So we can all grow. So we can all be more like Christ. So we can all have a, 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 a more meaningful and a, dip, a deeper and a richer life. The fifth reason I go to church is, I, you know, I want my life to, to make a difference. I want my life to really mean something. And if you study the New Testament, you see that when Jesus Christ, you know, in his sovereignty and wisdom, establish the church. And if you read the New Testament, it's very clear what he's doing. When he established the church, it becomes like a, the launching pad, and I did it again, hit the wrong button, help me out now, that he it established the launching pad for ministries in my life. It's the place where, you know, I, I move out into a world to make a difference in other people's life. It is God's plan. You can't get around it in the New Testament. It's God's plan for reaching the world for touching people, for making a difference in their lives, to see people literally transformed and changed forever. As I said, there are some side benefits. I want to strengthen my marriage. There's Professor Bradley Wright at the University of Connecticut did this study, and he kind of rebunked the idea, well, marriage in the church, divorce in, in the church is the same as it is in the world. That's not true. He found that Christians who rarely attend church 
They have a divorce rate at about 60% rate, which is pretty close to the world. But Christians who actively attend church, they're regularly in services at church, that divorce rate is only about 37%. Now, that's a pretty powerful statistic right there, I believe. Now, none of us, I, you know, I'm not planning on getting divorced, all right? But it does help that if you're a really committed believer, active within the body of Christ, the odds for your family falling apart are a lot better than they are if you're not committed to the body of Christ and committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So don't believe the lie that says, well, you know, it's the same rate as the world's got right. I don't want to divorce at all, but I like my chances better if I'm attending church. And so should you. And another important point about why I go to church, and this is something that young parents, you need to listen to very carefully. I want to train my children well. I'll be doing a series starting in October on uh, raising kids with no regrets, all right? Uh, not the kids not having regrets. They may have regrets that you raised them, but you won't have regrets, all right? <laughs> I want to train my children and well. They can get all the, the, you know, the stuff on math and English and you know, all the reading, writing, arithmetic stuff. They can get that at private school, public school, wherever. But it's in the church where they see the love of God. It's in the church, in my family, as well as where my family attends church, that they're exposed to the, the, the men of God and the women of God and people of integrity and people with character. And I want my children exposed to those kind of things. I want them exposed to God. I want them exposed to the Word of God. I want them to be around the people of God and to see what God is up to in other people's lives. I want them to, to, to grow for God. And they, they will learn not only within my family, but they learn within the context of God's greater family what it really means to love each other. I mean, we know that in our homes, part of our goal as parents is to teach our children how to, how to handle responsibilities and how to handle relationships. But... Listen, you take them to church, you expand that exponentially where they see it on a, even a greater scale. They learn how to resolve differences within their children's church and resolve their differences within the youth group and then as parents and on and on it goes. We learn to deal with relationships and how to keep them from falling apart and how to make them lasting when we get our kids involved religiously, which means regularly, in church. And I think... Church and coming to church and teaching your children those things about church is an important responsibility. My children learn there. Number eight, why do I come to church? And again, this is a fringe benefit. I want to live longer. <laughs> I want to, there's a passage in Deuteronomy in, in chapter 32, and this is just a portion of it, where God's promising the children of Israel when they go in, into the, to the, to the promised land, to, into Canaan, you know, that, that they obey the Lord with all their heart. And he said, you know, and you keep the commands that, that I've given to you and your sons, observe them carefully. Verse 47 says, it's not an idle word for you. Indeed, he's talking about his word to you, their commandment. This word I've given you, it's for your life. And by this word, you shall prolong your days in the land which you're about to cross to the Jordan to possess. But she's saying, you do what I tell you to do, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a fulfilled life and I'll give you a longer life. Well, how's that work? I don't know. But this is what the Bible says. And it's not just here. In fact, one of the first commandments out of the Ten Commandments, the first commandment with a promise was about living longer. Did you know that? He gave the command, but there's this one. It says, children, obey your parents. And he said, if you do that, then your, your life will be better. Your life will be longer. So, but this is not just one or two. But that's throughout the Word of God. There's a lot of places that talk about how God will sustain us and strengthen us and, and help us and encourage us if we're obedient to His Word, if we're taking His Word in our life, and, we're, and we're, we're making it a part of our life. In fact, even secular surveys verify that people who attend church at least three out of four weekends a month, they live an average of about seven years longer than people who don't. Isn't that amazing? So there are some fringe benefits to coming to church as well. Number nine, I want to have a better outlook on life. There's an online little magazine called eewmagazine.com, and in it they did a study that showed people who attend church regularly are more optimistic and they're more hope-filled than people who don't go to church. I want that. And it doesn't take long to walk out these doors today and just go into any place of business or go on to, your, to where you work on Mondays or go to school, and you'll see a lot of pessimistic people. They're just down, they're unhappy, they have no future for them in their mind, there's no real hope. They look at the economic scene, they look at the political scene, and there's lots of room for despair. But then you go to the house of God, and you see people who are really committed to Christ, and really committed to the body of Christ. Their whole outlook is different. I mean, it's amazing. I can sit back and see the world as, as it seems to be going to hell in a handbasket and still have joy in my own heart. Why can't I have that kind of peace 
because I have learned from the Word of God in the middle of the, the family of God with the people of God that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. I've learned that there's joy in Christ, and it's weekly where I'm reminded of that when I get to the house of God and encourage that because, hey, one week without church, you know, makes one week. You spell it differently, all right? And the meaning's different. You get real weak, and you begin to get to that point of pessimism instead of optimism. You get defeat instead of victory. But the more we come to fellowship together and we get consistent about it, the more we're reminded about the victory is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are not, the, we're not, we're not defeated. We are the conquering, we're the conquering force in the world, not the defeated force. So there's something about going to church that adds to the very outlook on your life. And number 10, which may seem a little selfish for some of you, but I don't believe it is because Jesus put it in there. He talks about rewards for the faithful. Faithful to what? Faithful to his commands. And his commands are very clear about where we should be in our life and what we should be doing in our spiritual life and where we get fed in our life and where we need to be to feed other people and how we get encouraged and how we encourage others. It's real clear. It's called the church. Well, I don't like organized religion. I always tell people, then join our church. We're just the most disorganized group. <laughs> Come be a part of Believer's Fellowship. What the whole thing here is that God does say, hey, Jesus even said, don't store up yourself treasures on earth. Moth and rust is corrupt, but store up treasures in heaven. How do you do that? Well, obviously in that part he was talking about giving and, and being a good steward of your finances, but there's other places when he's talking about being a good steward with your life, investing your life in other people's lives. Investing your time in other people's lives. Investing, you know, your passion uh, for, the, for the things of God in other people's lives. Learning how to invest your heart in other people's lives. Making a difference in the world around you. He said, that won't go unnoticed and it will not go unrewarded. The Bible talks about the beam of seed of Christ. Where, he said, where, 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 our, where all our works will be tried. Where, where we will be held accountable. And if our works were righteous works and they were God-honoring and for the glory of God, he says, then we will be rewarded. The Bible talks about crowns that will be given. In the book of Revelation, in the, in the, in, in the Gospels, it talks about investments. In the epistles, it talks about crowns that will be given to the saints for faithful service. And while well, the six, seven, eight crowns that are there are for different things, but they're all about the rewards that God has promised. And there are and will be incredible rewards in heaven for faithful service, for bringing people to Christ, for being responsible and carrying out the judgment over whatever area God told you to, to reign over and rule over in your life. Opportunities to sit with God on the throne. Read the letters to the churches in the first three chapters of Revelation where he says, to those that are overcomers, if you're going to walk with me and be faithful, you'll get to sit with me. There's just reward after reward. There's going to come a time when we stand before God and God gives us or we don't receive because we weren't faithful. I don't want to stand before God and see that God had designed one day it comes on like a light bulb that God had given us this institution and not just an organization but an organism called the living body of the Lord Jesus Christ and that was his way to reach a lost world for the gospel. Say, and I wasn't a part of it. You died for the church and I didn't care. I don't want to be a part of that. I want to receive the blessings that God has for me. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, Peter once asked the Lord, you know, he said, Lord, you know, we have left everything for you. We left treasures and houses and homes. And Jesus said, hey, hey everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake, they'll receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Now, one translation says, King James says, they will receive it in this life as well as inherit eternal life. In other words, God said, I'm not going to let you outgive me. And on top of that, not I'm going to outgive you, not only am I going to do it in this life, but in the life to come, I'm going to bless you. I believe that. It's in the Bible. You know, and I'm just the kind of guy that says, you know, if, that's, if there, I want that. I want, to, I want to honor the Lord in my life. So I come to church so that I can do that and, 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 and be effective in the world around me because I want to see what God has for me in heaven. Now, that's ten reasons, folks, pretty simple, why, why I come to church. There's about a hundred more if you want to go down the list. But why do we invite other people to church? And that's the important part, that we're not just living as islands. We realize that God has a purpose for our life. Let me give you a very five that goes faster than the last ten. One, I want to invite people because more people come to Christ in church services than anywhere else on the earth. 
There's a lot of places and a lot of things we can go, and you perhaps and I, we've witnessed to people and led people to Christ in their homes or on the streets or, uh, you know, in, in some place. And I've seen people saved in phone booths, surfboards, you know, uh, uh, apartment co- I've saved in an apartment complex. But the majority of people through the centuries who've come to Christ, the most of them have come when the body of Christ is assembled together, either for a crusade or just in a worship service, but it was through the, the effort and the ministry of that church. And more people have been brought to Christ in a church service than anywhere else on the earth. That's a pretty good reason to say, I want you to come to my church. I, I want you to receive the gospel. I want you to hear the gospel. We talk about national back to church Sunday next week. You can be sure, just like about every Sunday, we're going to give people the opportunity to know what the gospel is and how their lives can be changed by the gospel. But what happens? We have experienced a transformed life. And if I have been touched in such a way by Jesus, then I ought to be, I, I have Jesus living in my life, then his passion becomes my passion. And what was the passion of Christ? Jesus said, listen, I came to seek and save that which is lost. Now, if that was the purpose that Jesus clearly defined for his life and his goal and his ministry, and now that same Jesus lives in me, then what ought to be part of my life goal, purpose, and ministry? To seek and save the lost. That'll be a part of our life. And if that burns in you at all, it's because Christ is in you, because he's part of your life. And if we have been so moved by Jesus Christ, then second point here is that we want to introduce other people to Jesus Christ, especially the people we care about. You remember the story of Simon and Andrew? It was Andrew who first met the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was Andrew who went and found his brother and told Peter, you need to come meet this man. We have found the Messiah. You know, one of the reasons the church is the largest movement on the earth today is because people who meet Jesus want other people they love and know meet Jesus as well. I, 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 I wouldn't doubt that's probably the very first thing you did. If you made a decision for Christ and you fully understood what you were doing and you were broken in your heart over your sins and repentant over your past and really wanted to follow Christ, that you got on the phone and said, told somebody, hey, I've given my life to Jesus. It was my brother who called me about a year before I met Christ who'd given his life to Jesus, like Andrew calling Peter. He called me and says, hey, I found what we've been looking for. I found what you need. You need to to discover this. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I gave my life to Jesus. I said, what are you smoking? What's the matter with you? And he told me, I've given my life to Jesus. Listen, the first thing I want to do is tell people I loved and I knew about Jesus Christ. One of the first things I did after giving my heart to Jesus, I found, I knew right where all my friends would be that next day. I went to them and I shared with them about giving my life to Christ. I didn't want them to go to hell. I wanted them to know Jesus. Let me tell you, folks, there's a lot of people around us that we care about and that you care about, that you have this opportunity. But first, by virtue of the fact that you love them, And you want them to know life. And even this week, you're going to have probably somewhere between two or three conversations with people you really care about. My prayer is that one or two or three of those conversations will all be filled with that invitation. Hey, why don't you come to church with me Sunday? Why don't you come see what God's doing in my life? Why don't you come see what God's doing at my church? Because you care about them. Why do we invite people? One, because this is where most people are going to meet Jesus. Two, because I care about people. Three, if I've been really touched by the Lord and so moved by Him, I want to introduce Jesus not just to those I care about, but I want to ju- introduce Him to everyone, including those who don't necessarily care about me or maybe I hadn't cared about them. I think a great illustration of this is, is Jesus. He's going into Samaria, and they stop at the well, and Jesus sends the disciples into town. And you remember the story about the Samaritan woman you know, she's living with a guy, had several husbands, and she comes out to the well. She comes out at noon because all it's the time when nobody else is going to be at the well. She has people that don't care about her and people she doesn't care about. So she's not going to come in the morning when most of the women would come to gather water or evening when it's cool. She's going to come when nobody else is there. Why? She really doesn't want to see anybody. It could well be because she doesn't want to come under judgment or their criticism or she just would call them arrogant or hypocrite, whatever it is. She just doesn't want to deal with them. So she comes at a time she doesn't think anybody's going to be there. But guess who's there? Jesus is there. 
And Jesus begins to speak to her. And she begins to realize that he is the Messiah. And she trusts and she believes. In fact, she gets so excited about the transformation in her life, she leaves her water pot. She runs back into town to all those people she didn't care about and said, you've got to come meet this man who told me everything I ever did. And begins to explain to these people that didn't care about her and she didn't care about the Messiah. Maybe you know some people like that. And it'll probably be this week if you'll get real honest and get, you know, uh, get cognizant of what you're, what's really going around you this week. You, you're going to have somewhere between two and ten encounters with people you may not care about, just to be honest. Might be the guy behind the counter in the grocery store, some of the checkout clerk at Walmart. Maybe somebody pumping gas at the gas station by your car. Maybe somebody at the gym might be at an athletic event where you take your kids to go see a coach or something like that. Striking up a conversation might just well be awkward, difficult. But I want to suggest that the very few encounters you have this week will be awkward, just probably as awkward as it was for that woman to begin a conversation with Jesus or Jesus to begin that conversation. But we have the same opportunity to talk about how much Jesus has touched our life and how much he's made a difference with people that maybe before we haven't really taken time to care about and see what God does in their life. Because people who meet Jesus are moved by him, and they want to introduce him to everyone, including those that necessarily care about them. But there's one more category I don't want you to miss here, and I did it again. Go with me to number four. <laughs> people who've been touched by God are so moved by him that they want to introduce him to everyone to him, including their enemies. Now say, hold on there, okay. We did real good up to this point. But you know, I have some enemies. I have some people I don't, I don't talk to them. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to deal with them. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't say that? Yeah. Well, while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him by his son, Christ Jesus. Amen. That God took the extra step. But there is an interesting story that might do well. You know, today, get your Bible out and open up 1 Kings 5 sometimes. And there's an interesting little story. You may have heard it. You probably heard it in Sunday school, perhaps, about, you know, uh, about this guy from Syria. In fact, at that time, Syria was called Aram, all right? And Aram or Syria was much stronger than Israel. And from time to time, the Syrians, the Arameans, they would come in and they would invade Israel. All right? And when they came in, they would take whatever they could steal and they would also carry off people with them, sometimes children even, to be, become their slaves. Second Kings, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 1 says, Naaman, the captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master, and he was highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram, the man who was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. And the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who's in Samaria and he could cure him of his leprosy. Now hold on just a minute. This little girl has been taken from her family. This little girl has been pushed into indentured slavery. She's made to serve people. She lives in a culture that's not her own. She lives with people that are not her own. They don't even speak her language. They don't care about her. They don't love her. She's just a, a tool, a, a piece of equipment. They use her. Once she was free, had everything, loved by friends and family, by parents. Now she's a slave. She has no prospect of being released, being set free. And what does she do? She does something absolutely extraordinary. She looks on Naaman, and he is stricken with leprosy. And she encourages his wife to tell him he needs to go to Israel for a cure. Now, why does she do that? Maybe she's moved with compassion. Maybe she sees someone with a real need. She looks beyond the veneer and looks beyond the surface. And so many times there are people, perhaps, that we get in conflict. We see what they've done. We've heard what they said, and we don't like it. And it was offensive or it was hurtful. But somewhere in the context of the journey that we're on with Jesus, we're going to, have to come to the place of maturity in our life where we can look at somebody as Jesus looks at them. And we can look at them with a different set of eyes. And we look at somebody, she could look at Naaman and see his sickness and see his disease. Well, friends, there's all kinds of sickness in the world. We know all people who suffered from all kinds of obvious sicknesses. There's cancer and terrible diseases of all kinds. 
But the worst disease of all is that universal disease called sin, of which there is no cure of. It is terminal until someone comes to Jesus. There's no hope for somebody like that. God's Word makes it very clear the only cure for sin is the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle John says that we who were in darkness came to see a great light, and that light was the Lord Jesus who changed our lives. I love John 1, 12, when it says, To as many as receive Jesus, to them he gives the power to become the children of God. We have what people need, really need. Oh, they need a job, or they need this, or they need better clothes. They need it. No, what they really need. Who is it? perhaps in your own heart and mind, that you know really does have a greater need than what you've been perceiving. And that greater need is to know God and to come to Christ and to find the escape from hell and, the, and to find the release into life and victory. Who do you know like that? As John says, that we believe in his name, we've become the children of God. How about those that haven't become the children of God? So we not only want to take the gospel to people we care about, we even take it to those we don't necessarily care about or haven't cared about before. But we also take it to people who perhaps have been people we don't have want anything to do with. But the fourth kind is the people. The fifth kind, excuse me. If we've really been touched by God, we're going to be held accountable. A great illustration is found in Ezekiel. In chapter 33, there's that story about the, the watchman on the wall. And the, the Bible says if the watchman stands guard on the wall, he's in the tire, he's supposed to be watching for the enemy, and he sees the enemy coming and he doesn't blow the trumpet, then the blood is on his hands. He's guilty. The watchman on the tower is there to look out and to protect the city so that when he sees an enemy, the trumpet is sounded. There's a battle coming. There's a war coming. We're in danger. And the, 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 the whole illustration is given in Scripture to the prophet to say, hey, the real danger is spiritual. The real danger is out there. And if we're not faithful to sound the trumpet and to sound the alarm and to preach the gospel and to raise the cross and lift out of that standard, if we're not doing that, we will be held accountable. Just as much as we will receive the rewards for our righteous living, if we don't choose to live that way, then there are, well, the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ where the fire will fall. You say, well, what is that fire? I don't know but it's going to fall on every one of us and it's going to test us and it's going to try us to see if we really meant business or are we just playing church. Watchman on a tire. If you don't sound the warning, the blood will be on their hands. I don't want to be that because I believe people who really know Christ don't want that either. And sometimes we just need to be reminded, but that's why we come to church, <laughs> to have that reminder, to have that encouragement to have those warnings at times, as well as the comforts. So repeat this after me. Are you ready? Hey! hey. Next, Sunday. Next Sunday. It's National Back to Church Sunday. Back to church Sunday. All over the country. Would you come to church with me next Sunday? Say that one more time. Would you? That is so hard to do, isn't it? That is so difficult and so crippling. To have to, no, it isn't. It just takes a little ounce of boldness of which God has provided you more with an ounce, amen, that you can, you can be used by God, and you'll be surprised how that little invitation right there will lead to other invitations to people, to talk to them about the Lord, to share your testimony, to give them a word from God. But letting people know that, hey, you know, the world may be going to hell in a handbasket, but there's some people in the basket that still care. Amen. There's some people around that still are concerned about other people. And that's why, you know, I, I even share with our leadership dinner, as I repeat that again, that we talked about on Friday night, this is not just some kind of PR campaign, all right? This is what we're about, reaching people. This is what it's all about in our life, that not only do we receive instruction, not only do we get encouraged, not only do we have edification, but we're there in the world like salt and light to make a difference in other people's lives. Would that be you? Would you do that? I would encourage you again to be praying. We have over here on our wall is what we call in our prayer wall, all right? And there's all those little stickies up there. With, some of them have one name on them. Have, some of them have five or six names on them. So how do you know? Because I've been over there and started praying over all those, all right? And I've, I've come in here and I've gone up the wall and spent some time in prayer over here, praying over these prayer requests with you. But not only praying over those prayer requests, with you, I've been praying for you as I pray for them. So Lord, whoever put this up here, all right? Who put, put, give them strength, give them, give them boldness, give them a reminder. It's so easy to get so occupied, we just forget. 
But we need to set priorities and realize this is one of the great priorities, get people in the sound of the gospel, get people around the Word of God, get people around the people of God. And you know people. Some are believers that used to go to church, and they, it, it's easy to get out. Even Paul said that. I, mean, I believe it's Paul who wrote Hebrews. We he said, hey, you know, let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. I don't want to be the some there. But there are some who just don't, don't come when they could, who find every reason, every excuse not to come. He said, don't be like that. Make sure that you assemble together regularly. And we could go into a whole other sermon series on what regularly means. If you just study the Bible, you won't have to have the sermon series. But those names are over there. You know people who aren't coming to church. And then you know people who don't know Jesus, and that's why they're not coming to church. Care for them. Commit yourself to the Lord in this regard. Take this up, but not just this Sunday, but every, really, every, every Sunday, amen? Just, just begin to pray. There are postcards out on the table in the lobby when you leave. There's invite cards. If you've been inviting somebody, all right, this, the, the last couple of weeks to come with you on, on National Bank Church Sunday, do this, all right? Send them an email, remind them. Give them a phone call, remind them. And then get one of those postcards out there and put your name on it and put their name on it, their address on it. Put a stamp on it and mail it to them. Get it in the mail about Tuesday, all right? And Tuesday, they'll probably get it Thursday or Friday. Some, you know, it gets real snail mail. It gets there on Saturday. But they'll see that and they'll think for a moment, I guess these people really do care. They took enough time to take just a minute to even write a card, sign a card, put a stamp on it, and put it in the mail for me. Maybe they do care. Any way you can. Some of you are social media freaks. Put it out there every day. You know, Facebook, emails, bulk email, whatever you do, you know, tweet, twit, whatever. Get it out there. Tell people. Be radical. Be revolutionary in your love for souls and your love for God. Because that's what... Jesus came, his purpose was to seek and save that was lost. Let's be a part of what he's doing in the world. Amen? Would you stand with me with our heads bowed?